morning. Let's wake up with watches. As you know, everything on the table is on sale and everything is available even if it has not been posted to our website yet. As always, in the description, you're gonna find the name and the reference of every watch as well as the asking price. So we don't have to talk about price during the discussion. And that's a good thing because there is an incredible array on the table today. Everything from a $700 porcelain dial Chinese watch that I have, which is a bit of an unusual subject for this show, but I guarantee it will be fun all the way up to F.P. Journe, Patek Philippe, Vacheron, Moser, and Langa. Let's get started with the timepiece that I often pitch as the best value in all around luxury horology. This is the 38.5 millimeter stainless steel Omega Seamaster Aquaterra annual calendar. Now what sets it apart from almost every other watch is its sheer range of competence. Let's talk about what that range is. First, size, 38.5 millimeters in stainless steel. It is a universal timepiece. Let's talk about dial. It was blue before blue was cool, as this model bowed back in 2008. Brought to market in 2009, it featured the first use of the silicon hairspring in the Omega 8500 family, making it a robustly resistant 150 meter anti-magnetic watch, water resistant and magnetic resistance, and an annual calendar, which means it has the everyday friendly complication. All of this with a 60 hour power reserve and a COSC certified Swiss chronometer movement that is a coaxial escapement. So let's talk about the two versions we've got here. First on the bracelet. Now this is the version I recommend you buy if you want the most versatile watch and you want the most versatile arrangement, as you will never need to worry about swapping it onto a strap that is water resistant. The bracelet is nicely made, as you can see polished center links. Yep, a few fingerprints, I apologize, but this is raw and this is real. Now the clasp itself, which we have managed to stick together with our ID tag, features a twin trigger deployant system. And as you'll find, the full deployant ensures you're not gonna drop it in a marine environment if you do take it swimming. There is a caliber 8601, which is an annual calendar, twin mainspring barrels, 25, 200 beat rate, full balance bridge with a free sprung index for shock resistant. And of course you have the arabesque Cote de Genève with blackened and polished rather than blued screws. Turn it all over to the dial side. And you can see that I have set up a bit of a showcase of the annual calendar system, which requires adjustment only once a year during the jump from February to March. You can see it's September and we are gonna roll it through midnight and it makes the jump cleanly through the 30 day month to the 1st of October. That's what an annual calendar can do for you. Now we'll throw the two on the wrist. I'll show you the bracelet and then I'll show you the strap. They're both wonderful pieces because they are so universal in their size. Nice and compact from lug to lug. You can see on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, this watch wears an absolute treat. There's plenty of room on both sides. It is a unisex option. And even though there is a larger version of the annual calendar, this is the version that I would want on my wrist. Now on a strap, the watch is a bit more formal. I'm not gonna lie, alligator has that effect. You can see full alligator blue. It's a navy blue that actually quite well matches the dial. There is a full polished stainless steel trigger actuated deployant clasp. Throw this on the wrist and it's a more classical look. It's a bit more upscale. It's a bit more formal, as I mentioned. If you want the watch for daily use in an office and you know you're never gonna take it in the shower, in the pool, in the ocean, this might be the look for you as the leather strap certainly helps the Aquaterra look to grow up a bit. And this is the adult version of the watch. Nevertheless, I recommend all the same. If you're gonna look at these two watches on our website, buy the one with the bracelet and add the strap rather than the other way around. It's simply a better economic argument. That said, there are watches on the table that might offer even a bit more exclusivity and perhaps a bit of vintage nostalgia thrown in. This is the 2014 Breitling Transocean limited edition of 2000 pieces, 43 millimeters in stainless steel. It features a little bit of a champagne colored hour track that is designed to channel the essence of 1950s Breitling chronographs. Twin register, it's a modified Breitling B01 caliber that has the two registers rather than the three with a lovely crosshair style center dial. And you can see that subtle two-tone with applique indices gives it an upscale vintage look. It is nostalgic, but it is not crude. Now you also saw the instantaneous minute jumper right there, one of the hallmarks of the B01 in-house caliber. You could see 2000 pieces individually numbered and a very, very rare feature on any Breitling watch. It's a little bit unusual to get a display case back on a Breitling watch, even in the Georges current era, that still feels new. But to get a display case back that is also a hunter case back is truly special. Still 100 meters water resistant. You could see that COSC certified 
three-day Powerwall Reserve vertical clutch column wheel Breitling in-house caliber, and thanks to the solid case back, if you wish, you can still have it personalized without masking the caliber. One of the best column wheel feels in the business. It's up there with Longa, Rolex, and Zenith for the tactile impression you get when actuating the chronograph. There is an Ocean Classic bracelet, which is a lovely mesh style with a 1950s and 60s inspired straight bar look. And you can see, though it is a large watch at 54 millimeters, about 55, 54 lug to lug, it still fits on a smaller wrist because of the shape of the case, which is, is as important as the size of the case. Okay, now we're gonna talk a little bit about the Holy Trinity, three that are, and well, two that are, and, and one that should be. I, I'm gonna say even possibly two that should be, and we're gonna start with the Grand Dame of them all, but Patek Philippe of Geneva, along with Audemars Piguet and Vacheron Constantin, Patek Philippe is considered to be part of the Swiss Holy Trinity of High Horology. Now, the watch you see here is the 5070G, 42 millimeters in white gold. This is a model series that was made from 2002 to 2006, with about 250 made in each metal each year. Now, as you can see, timepiece is a little bit fingerprinty, and I'll remove some of that, but it's the charm of the dial with its multiple scales, its somewhat swollen registers, and its pagoda-style stacked flat bezel that gives the watch a lot of its character. You can see a vintage, nostalgic, laterally stamped hallmark on the lug, and you can see that the lugs are wonderfully intact at all four corners. That is the first thing you look at when you're evaluating an old 5070 online. How intact are the lugs and how intact are their stepped fluted flanks. That is very important because this is the first thing to go when these watches are excessively and unsympathetically refinished. You'll also appreciate the fact that there is still a sharp break between the case band and the lug, another element that tends to go with refinishing. Turn it all over, you can see the legendary CH2770. Now, it is a manual wind La Magna 2310 Abouche, that beats away at 18,000 vibrations per hour, manual wind, column wheel, lateral clutch chronograph, it bears all, it sh keeps no secrets. You can see it's huge balance, almost the radius of the movement beaten away at 18K, an overcoil hairspring made by hand, Gyromax, Patek Philippe, signature, free sprung balance architecture, that overcoil hairspring allowing the watch to be exquisitely adjusted to perfection in five positions relative to gravity. You can see Poinçon de Genève, this is all pre-2009, so you have the Geneva seal right there on the half bridge for the balance, Cote de Genève, satin finished steel levers with beveled sides for the chronograph and the yoke, as well as an engine turned prolage on the base plate and all screws black polished with chamfered slots. Throw it on the wrist and you can see that this watch is impressive, though not overbearing. At under 48 millimeters from lug to lug, the 5070 is a gentle giant. Broad, flat, and saucer-like on the wrist, it has a handsome aspect ratio, and you can see why this timepiece is considered to be an all-time great at Patek Philippe. It's not yet vintage, but it's getting to the point where it is an undeniable classic with its turn as a true vintage investment level Patek soon to come up. Get ahead of the curve. That said, it's not my favorite Patek Philippe, or even my favorite Patek Philippe on the table. On both counts, we have to talk about the 5235G regulator. Previewed back in 2011, the watch didn't actually debut until 2013 because of issues industrializing some of the Patek Philippe advanced research elements, the unlubricated silicon escapement in conjunction with the silicon hairspring, effectively making it the production implementation of all but the Gyromax SI Patek Philippe advanced research technologies. There's a new movement too, as you can see. This is caliber 31260, REG, a regulator, but with all new bridge pattern, and you can see it is far larger than the previous 1977 caliber 240 micro rotor, which is both smaller and has a less ornate set of bridges. You can see how the train from the barrel to the great wheel, to the third wheel, the fourth wheel, and the escape wheel follows a logical progression across ultimately individual finger style bridges in Geneva tradition. There is an engine turn prolage on the base plate, perfectly aligned Cote de Genève, and you can see they are ridged, darker on one side and lighter on the other. That's the sign of abrasive wheel Cote de Genève, not stamped with a mirrored anglage on the edge of every bridge, as well as every jewel and screw sink. 22 karat gold winding mass with ceramic rotor bearings for efficiency, beaten away at a very quirky 23,000 
75 beat rate. So it has its own unique beat rate optimized for the silicon components. On the dial side, it is an annual calendar and it is a regulator. You have your seconds, you have your minutes, you have your hours, you have your day, you have your date, you have your month. It too need be adjusted only once per year, the jump from February to March. But not only is it a regulator, it features stop seconds. And this officially became the second non-chronograph Patek Philippe to feature a stop seconds or hacking functionality. Other details, all of the calibrations of the dial, the indices, the chapter rings, the hash marks are a lovely lacquered blue. The calendar discs are printed blue on steel silver. And you can see that there is a vertical satin grain, almost like the body panels of a DeLorean car. And take note, the Patek Philippe Genève script on the dial has been engraved rather than stamped or lacquered. This is a sensational 40.5 millimeter white gold watch that channels the ghost of the great 3448 perpetual calendar that ran from the early 1960s through the early 1980s. And you can see those sharp conical profiles at the edge of the bezel, the thrusting geometric facets of the double finished polished and satin finished lugs and you can see how far Patek Philippe in-house case making has come with the sharp break between lug and case band. All of this exquisite and easy to wear. A regulator, an annual calendar, a breakthrough model and a technological milestone. It is all of those things for Patek Philippe and if I could own just one Patek it wouldn't be a grand comp. It would be this. Price no object. This is the one for me. Now I promised you holy trinity Two that are, and well, two that should be. Let's talk about Vacheron Constantin. A little bit closer to the heart and soul of Geneva watchmaking in the early 20th century, we have here the Royal Eagle Chronograph. Royal Eagle was launched in 2001, one year after the Malt collection, and initially Royal Eagle and not Malt was the Tonneau Case series. This watch was designed to bring younger people into the Vacheron brand, so it launched immediately with what was then, courtesy of Franck Muller, the very chic Tonneau form, and a stainless steel case, an early iteration of steel in a launch model from Vacheron. Now, the dial has a wonderful ruthenium satin grain, and you can see there's a polished chapter ring to small seconds with sunken registers and an anthracite coloration for the registers. It is the same movement you'll find in the Royal Oak Chronograph first and second generation, which is to say a Frédéric Piguet 1185 five position adjusted high horology automatic vertical clutch column wheel chronograph, Vacheron supplying the big date complication. Now, on the wrist, the watch is actually fairly substantial. Uh, far be it for an early 2000s Vacheron to span 52 millimeters lug to lug, but this watch was anything but typical. Now before the malt collection and its strident and striking lugs was merged with the Royal Eagle collection to become the malt tonneau case collection in 2008, this was easily the most outrageous and outstanding form in the Vacheron catalog as it was an unabashed tribute to the 1920s and 30s, that era of grand luxury before the round format had become standard and default for wristwatches, which were then new. What I also love about this watch is that there is a camber or a curvature to the case back which helps it to fit a little bit more easily on a small wrist, a lovely form about the stepped lugs. So you can see they are both polished and satin finished for contrast. That is a delectable detail. And then there is a cambered sapphire and you can see that it actually curves to match the arc of the case. There are also half frosted broadsword hands that contrast beautifully on the style that features radially arrayed and stylized Arabic numerals in a lovely sort of Art Nouveau font, pre-Art Deco, a wonderful timepiece. But probably not my favorite Vacheron on the table. Now, this is the Patrimony Contemporain Manual Wind Ultra Thin Excellence Platine. 40 millimeters and only 6.8 millimeters thick. You can see the sharp break at the flank of the case where the case and the lugs join. That sharp break is a sign of advanced high horology hand finishing and case assembly. Again, the watch about 6.8 millimeters thick features not just platinum on the case, not just platinum for the crown, but per the Excellence Platine collection, or we shall call it Excellence Platine. We have a full platinum hallmarked frosted sandblasted dial, a platinum case, a platinum crown. We have a watch with a full platinum buckle, and then you have a lovely minimalist sheer sided alligator leather navy blue strap and the dial of the watch with applique white gold indices, white gold Vacheron logo, and white gold hands. Throw it on the wrist and it absolutely disappears. It's substantial for a 
ultra thin manual wind timepiece and 40 millimeters is a generous size here. The watch almost disappears so flat you can cuff it with any sleeve and the watch is so thin that Vacheron fit a solid case back such that the watch would not actually bend and deform on the wrist and it's like having an extra platinum coin built into the watch because it adds substantially to the mass on the wrist. Elegance incarnate and the essence of Vacheron Constantin. Excellence platine. Everything platinum. Jumping into the two that should be. Let's start with Gégère Lecoult. Let's start with the 2014 Duomet, a quantième lunaire, Emel Grand Faux. Now this is, as you can see, Emel Grand Faux, because it is a Grand Faux enamel dial. So a grand flame or big fire that's been fired at up to 800 degrees centigrade up to 20 times to create this vitreous coating on top of a gold dial base. So you have the paint that is a white glass-based paint that is then fired repeatedly to create the dial you see here, which is lustrous and glossy. You can really see it on the surround of the Foudroyant. It's a little bit imperfect. It has some of the ridges and the rolls, the undulations of a true enamel dial. It's not a picture-perfect factory lacquer, and it's beautiful for it. The details are exquisite, including the shocks of red, and you can see that there is a lovely polished white gold bezel around the crescent aperture for the moon face, and a lovely polished white glossy gleaming moon inside a pointer date apparatus and you can actually charge and change the pointer date just like that. It's very easy to do and the feel is that of a fine column wheel chronograph. Now you will also know the watch features a double zero reset system. So chronometry being the focus of this model, I pull the crown with my reduced nails, that stops the foudroyant at the index, and then I pull the rest of the way and it resets. Now I can set my watch to the second as well as the sixth of a second. I have the time, I have the date and the moon phase, two power reserves, turn it all over, and you can see the caliber that powers the works, caliber 381, full majeure or nickel copper zinc bridges. It's the same nickel copper zinc golden untreated material used in German silver, a la Alanga und Zona, and I'll prove that because I've got the Alanga one time zone right next to it. And you can see that same golden hue. This is not rhodium plated traditional Swiss. And that's because the movement that informs the design of the Duomet caliber was an 1880s minute repeating chronometer pocket watch from the JLC Factory Museum, the Heritage Gallery. Two mainspring barrels on that Victorin Piguet et Bauch, finished by but then Le Coult, and two barrels, one of which only powers the balance, the other powers the time and the complications, ensuring that despite the power intensive complications, there's no loss of amplitude, 50 hour power reserve for both, and you wind both barrels using a common crown. You can see their pocket watch style double ratchet system so they can move in opposite directions. And there is fantastic depth to this movement, which you can see to good effect from an angle. Now the watch was made in 40.5 millimeters with the new style domed bezels, so the 40.5 arrived in 2012. The Cantiem Lunaire, that is the moon phase date, arrived in the Dual Med collection in 2010. And this was a 200 piece, 40.5 millimeter white gold limited series of 200 pieces for 2014. Throw it on the wrist and it's an absolute pleasure. Although I owned the 42 millimeter white gold dual med chronograph and I never had any issues with the fit, I will admit this is better. And you can see the case is exquisitely finished with double finish. Satin finish about the case band and polish about the lugs. And as with some of the advanced case constructions I've demonstrated tonight, there is a sharp and clear break between the welded lugs and the profile of the case. How much do you love that double knurled crown with a blasted base and a polished and relieved JL logo? And that is just the crown. They sweated the details with this one. One of the best watches you could buy at any price. That said, I have an attachment to the old JLC Platinum Blue Dial collection that debuted with several 250 piece limited editions back in 2001. And this was arguably, next to my own previous late great Grand Memovox, this was arguably the pick of the litter. Now this is the Master Calendar, or Master Moon as it's sometimes known. It is formally the Master Moon, because the Master Calendar doesn't have a moon. And you can see it is a German language calendar with a triple date and a moon face, a lunette style pointer date outboard, and you'll note all applique dart style and faceted diamond polished indices with tri-Arabics 9, 12, and 3 in a 37 millimeter platinum case with a spectacular sunburst blue. I would almost call it a slate sunburst blue dial. Now, the timepiece has another exquisite feature. As with our Breitling that we discussed earlier, this is a watch that includes a hunter-style case back, exquisitely individually numbered and featuring the 
signature of the watch having passed the master 1000 hours control chronometry test, but we get the solid platinum case back. We don't lose anything in the process of gaining a display case back. You get both. And this was back in the day when JLC still used six position adjustment on its watches. And take note, not only six position adjustment, one more than a chronometer standard, but the mass for the rotor is PT950. So instead of conventional 22 karat gold, and JLC still used 22 karat back when this watch was made, it features a platinum winding mass, an exceptional refinement that is both rich and more efficient than a standard gold mass. You'll also appreciate that the movement, though largely finished using mechanical techniques, still includes some traditional hand finishing, as well as kiln-fired annealed blue screws. So this is an incredible watch. And in 37 millimeters, it feels remarkably substantial for its size, even as it wears on any wrist. I'll also mention that because this was part of a pre-2005 series, you're not getting a white gold deployant clasp on your platinum JLC watch. After 2005, 2006 on, you would get a double folding white gold clasp on a platinum JLC. Here you can see both polished and media blasted platinum PT950 written right inside the clasp. More substance, more platinum. That's just more fun throw it on the wrist, the 37 wears easily. I owned this watch, this exact watch, in its black dial steel iteration. This one's richer in every way. And with the platinum winding mass, it's even a little bit more functional. If you happen to love the charm of a foreign language calendar, this is perfect for you. A French watch that speaks German brought to you by an English language YouTube channel. Are we cosmopolitan or what? And again, this does feature a matching blue alligator leather strap, which is a perfect combination, and it is an easy watch to fit on a smaller wrist. Now, let's jump back to our sports watches for a moment and talk about everyone's favorite, or at least everyone's obsession, which is Rolex. Let's talk about a watch that's now discontinued, uh, a full gold 326935 white gold Sky Dweller. Now this is a GMT and an annual calendar, and you can see a few unusual features already. Radially arrayed Arabic numerals, as well as a matte black base. You can see that dial is not the usual Rolex loss, a gloss lacquer, and you'll also appreciate that this watch is multiply functional, as it includes an annual calendar and a GMT. The GMT part is fairly intuitive. You have the ring at the center, which is a 24 hour single circuit per day, second time zone with an index right underneath the Rolex crown telling you the time of day. Now the watch is also an annual calendar and I'm gonna demonstrate how this works. 42 millimeters in white gold, let's get by the basics. It's a COSC chronometer, 100 meters water resistant and it does include a three day power reserve. But let's talk about the annual calendar. First, we're gonna thread the crown out, pull the crown and the first thing that is in the first position Let's start from the beginning. I can't do anything right here. I can wind the watch in the first position, but when I pull the crown out, nothing happens. Now I turn one click and you'll see that I can adjust the calendar system. And you'll note as I adjust the calendar system, there is a small aperture jumper that orbits the dial. 12 hours, 12 months. Therefore, the 9th is September. Watch the date and watch it coordinate with the aperture jumper. Do you see how I'm jumping right there? between October and September with the annual calendar system, that is a quick set that allows me to set the watch bi-directionally. Okay, now let's turn it one more click. Now I have independent access to the hour hand, which I can set separately, you'll note, from the 24 hour time zone, and I can drive the date forward as I do so. Turn it one more time. Now I put the watch in hack seconds mode. This is the only way to stop the seconds, and I can adjust everything in sync. You can see the 24 hour as well as the 12 hour adjusted, synchronized. Turn the crown, well first, turn the bezel, which is known as ring command, and which is part of the Rolex Caliber 9001 movement, turn it all the way back, justified clockwise, screw the crown back in, throw it on the wrist, and now we get our wrist shot of this mighty mass of metallic magnificence. 42 millimeters, it wears a large 42. It's reasonable from lug to lug, and you can see that the end links don't really project beyond the case, so that helps its fit. I would recommend this watch for a wrist as small as 14 centimeters, though on anything smaller than 15, it's gonna look large. Uh, the sweet spot is 16 centimeters circumference or larger with a full white gold bracelet. It does feel incredible on the wrist. A Rolex white gold full bracelet feels like other brands platinum. Now, we're not done with Rolex, but here's a watch that we don't often discuss. A Coke bezel once 
06710 X Series circa 1991. This is a 40 millimeter pre super case that is largely intact. As you can see, it's been refinished a little bit, though relatively charitable in its refinishing. There's no protrusion of spring bar beyond the lugs. The watch is lovely and lustrous. Uh, I mentioned that gloss black Rolex dial. Well, that's exactly what you have here. It contrasts with the matte black of the Sky Dweller. And you can see that there is a true GMT Master 2 arrangement here, whereby that 12-hour hand can be set independently of the 24-hour hand. And you have a bi-directional Coke-style bezel that allows you to offset from GMT. If you do set the 24-hour hand to Greenwich Mean Time, you can temporarily read three time zones on this watch. White gold hands, white gold indices, inside Rolex 48 hour chronometer, caliber 3185. Throw it on the wrist, you can see it's got a different look than a modern GMT, largely because of the pivoted end links and the more elegant case. I would say this watch is a little bit nostalgic in its form, but still very modern in its spec with 100 meter water resistance, full balance bridge, chronometer certified, high beat sapphire crystal. This is a timepiece that you can wear in good conscience, even though it is an emerging front in vintage, the early 1990s. Nevertheless, this one hasn't yet become fragile, so it's a nice sweet spot between modern and true vintage. On my wrist, you can see it wears traditionally. It's handsome. It's a lovely Coke style bezel in an era, ours, when you cannot buy a new Coke bezel Rolex. I suspect that will change, but at the same time, right now, an older GMT Master 2 or GMT Master remains the only game in town. Let's talk about a timepiece that is probably one of the rarest modern zeniths, and I mean that. 500 to 1,000 pieces made over about 12 to 18 months of production. This is the Zenith El Primero Retro Timer, and it's one of the strangest watches Zenith has ever made. With a caliber 4055 only ever used in this model, there were two versions. So that 500 to 1,000 piece production is broken up over two models, of which this one is generally considered to be the more popular. It has a carbon style embossed dial with a 30-minute chronograph register, and you will note a continuously running flyback chronograph seconds hand. It is always running. The retro timer can be reset, but it can never be stopped. Otherwise, it's a Zenith El Primero in the Chronomaster case, 42 millimeters, 100 meters water resistant. It features a quick set date. It is beautifully balanced, and while no pre-Day 21 El Primero can engage hacking or stop seconds to synchronize to a reference time, guess what? You can synchronize the seconds of this one along with the hours and minutes at center because of the flyback capability. And if you're wondering what that little red hash inside the 30 minute register is, that is reportedly the time to stop cooking a favorite dish of the watch's designer. It might be folklore, but that is Zenith's story and they're sticking with it. All applique indices. So the dial features an upscale presentation. The watch has a stainless steel construction with a PVD overlay and a remarkably deluxe double deployant clasp with a trigger release system. And again, one of our pricing stickers has stuck a clasp together. I wish they would really stick these together a little bit differently. Oh well, I'm not going to worry about it. See if I can throw it on my wrist all the same. All right. Stupid stickers. All right. Now, this is an interesting watch because you can see it is relatively short from lug to lug, though you can't really see where the lugs end. Because of the conforming profile of the strap itself, it's fairly easy to just envision this as an unbroken monolithic black band around the wrist. The integration of this model is incredible from an aesthetic standpoint, and it is a very imposing look with an ultra high grade vanilla scented natural vulcanized rubber strap, though this was considered to be an entry level piece in the collection. In the fashion that many entry-level watches often are, it's slowly becoming one of the true grail collectibles of the Jean-Frédéric Dufour era of Zenith, which lasted from roughly 2010 to early 2015, and this is one of the plums. I've actually written a piece... Let me just get rid of this stupid tag. I've written a piece for Quill and Pad about this watch that is going to publish as a collector's guide, and the collector's guide is going to be a very cool rundown of what these watches should be worth, what you should pay for them, how you can find them, boxes, papers, accessories, because I am a huge fan of this model. I might include some photos. Uh, look for that to publish soon. I'm real excited about putting that out there.
It's also got a few nods to comic book fans. Now let's talk about more watches on straps and one that I think was the best Rolex of 2017. I'm sorry, but this thing is just sex. Yellow gold, the oldest gold, in a Daytona with an Oyster Flex strap. It does not get any better. I love the combination of the yellow gold deposit inlays on the Cerachrome bezel and the sunburst golden dial with polished registers and blackened white gold indices. How awesome do those blackened indices look? Now you have the registers, which are a handsome tone on tone, but with a concentric guilloche that gives them a lovely metallic, I would sort of say differential, as internally they have a different finish than their rims, and you can see that contrast between the rim and the center. Throw it on the wrist, and it is an impressive clasp, I have to say. This is a watch that feels like it will last a lifetime, and I generally reserve that kind of praise for watches that are on bracelets. And technically, the Oyster Flex is a bracelet, as this strap features a titanium alloy that runs from end to end, so you can't cut it. You can size it and you can adjust micrometrically with the clasp. Now, the watch, as you can see, features no projecting end links, so it actually wears better than the same timepiece on a bracelet. I realize that's gonna be a little bit jarring for some of you, because I'm wearing the watch backward. Let me throw it on correctly. Right side up. Upside down, turn it over and take a look. 16 centimeter circumference wrist. This is the one to own. There was one in rose and there was one in white gold. And while I'm normally a white metal kind of guy, this thing is just too cool. I mean, that is the definition of awesome. I'm not a Rolex fanboy, but I am a fanboy and a partisan of this watch. I'm throwing this one alongside the retro timers. One of the watches on this table I most wish to make mine. Here, you guys share some space. One of you should be in my collection. Let's talk about German watches. Glasuta Original. Let's talk about the Panograph. This is a timepiece that was launched in 2002. It's 39.5 millimeters in a lovely pink gold, and you'll appreciate that it is an unusual scrolling display. So you have your minutes from 0 to 10, from 10 to 20, and from 20 to 30, and there are three prongs, each one shorter than the last, and they revolve around so you can read more easily the minutes register. Now the watch is a flyback chronograph, and a most unusual flyback chronograph, as it is inverted with the reset trigger up at 2 o'clock and the start-stop trigger down at 4 o'clock. You have a quick set system for the date, which is wonderful because many Geo watches actually feature a pusher adjuster in the case flank. Now we have the quick set system and you have the ability to rapidly set that double digit pano or panorama datum, the outsized date. Turn it over, things get even better. Caliber 6101, manual wind, 41 joule, 42 hour power reserve, 4 hertz beat rate, a fully jeweled lateral clutch. And you can see the system with a column wheel actuator. Let's polish this case back, remove my fingerprints, and you can see. There's a lot to love here. First, you'll note that the lever arms that interact with the column wheel are themselves jeweled for crisper action and greater longevity. The lateral clutch is fully jeweled, an unusual refinement as even on high horology watches, lateral clutches generally include at least one bushing. And there is a black polished swan's neck style spring that tensions the clutch against the driving wheel at the center. You'll also appreciate a black polished blue annealed screw fix Glasuta Original Signature plaque that gives you the name of the maker and nothing else. It's a wonderful piece of fabulous and fatuous fluff. And then there's a freehand engraved half bridge. This is a wonderfully colorful movement with silver in various different finishes from perlage to black polish to satin. We have blues, we have golds, we have the violet of the pivot jewels, and all of this in a movement that is hand finished. And you can see there's a beautiful anglage on the edge with engine turning on the base and la suta stripes. You even have jewels set in screw fixed chaton in pocket watch fashion, a nod to the great pocket watches of Saxon lore and heritage, throw it on the wrist, an easy watch to wear. It's not a big watch, and for that reason, you're gonna find that this multiple complication is a bit more wearable on smaller wrists. It's a timepiece that I would pick over our next candidate from Germany, which I have to admit is just a little too large for me. That said, sometimes large means in charge, and we are talking about a Lange und Zona, which does everything with excellent manners. If big is bold, this one in yellow gold can't possibly get any better. Two time zones, there is a geographic style system. So you set your reference city at that little index inside the second time zone. Both second time zone, that is your remote or reference time zone, and local time zone have day-night indicators. When I use the pushers on the flank of the case, I change my reference city and the sub-register with the second time zone will do all the math. And that is a wonderful feature. There is a pusher adjuster 
as you would expect for the Panorama Dunham, so you can enjoy toggling with the pusher feel of a fine column wheel chronograph. 41.9 millimeters, this model launched in 2005, uses the original Grand Longa 1 case, which is nice because for a lot of folks, the subsequent 40.9 just isn't big enough. You can see the sensational pocket watch style spiral wheels in silver as well as gold, and there's a lovely freehand engraved half bridge for the wheel that governs the complication, as well as a freehand engraved half bridge with black polished swan's neck regulator for the movement itself. Manual wind, three day power reserve, and throw it on the wrist. It's a little bit large for me, but it does have the good taste of maintaining a flat profile and a relatively thin construction. So while I recommend a bigger wrist than mine, you get a good sense of the watch. It's comfortable, it's broad, it's elegant, and though it is big, again, it does everything with outstanding refinement and comportment. It never feels like an oversized watch. Sticking with Saxony, a brand we rarely feature on the show, and this may be the debut for the Nomos Glasuta Lambda family. Now, the Lambda bowed as a 42mm watch in 2013. For 2015, this model, the Lambda 39, debuted. It features the same 84-hour power reserve, and the power reserve is the dominant feature of the dial, filigree-style or wire-like hands. There is a bubble sapphire atop, and the case itself is only 9.54mm thick. 39mm, this is the luxury Longa with a retail price of $17,000. And you turn it over and you see why. It's not just the precious metal case, it is the hand finished flagship caliber DUW 1001. Manual wind twin mainspring barrels with an 84 hour power reserve. It too features a Longa style freehand engraved half bridge. And let me see if I can turn this on its side. But it appears to say, if I'm translating correctly, with love from Glasuta. So it even has a little personal message for you from the maker. You can see there's a solar or sunway, sunray a coat or stripe that radiates out from the ratchet wheel at center. And you'll appreciate the fact that the jewels are set in screw fixed chaton as you'd find on a longa. There is real hand finished mirrored englage on the edge of the half bridge for the balance as well as the three quarter pocket watch style bridge. You have those blued screws that are kiln fired. And when you throw this watch on the wrist, you can see it is elegance incarnate. Competitive with anything from the more heralded brands. We're not used to paying almost $20,000 for a Nomos, but this watch makes the case convincingly. A better buy pre-owned? You better believe it. But all the same, you're getting the, exactly the same level of craft, knowledge, artisanal attention to detail, and I would even go so far as to say greater rarity than what you will find with Golasuta Original and Langa. This is a truly special watch, and if you ask me, the 39 is the size to get. Continuing with independent brands, we have so many of them on the show. I'm losing track. The F. Pigeon Chronomet Optimum. 40 millimeters. This is the boutique edition with the Remontoir de Galate constant force device. Let's wind it up so you can see it in constant force jump second mode. A 70 hour power reserve. The watch can maintain constant amplitude. That is no loss of amplitude for 45 of its 75 hours of reserve. Now on the dial side, you can see there is a sweep second system. You can see the Remontoir beating away at one second per pulse. And on the case back, there is a deadbeat seconds dial. One second bursts of power transmitted from the twin mainspring barrels to the escapement. That means that regardless of the power or lack thereof, down to 45 hours elapsed, you're going to get the same force and thus the same amplitude at the escapement. Twin mainspring barrels, six position adjustment, constant force, remontoir de galette, titanium spring, a double direct impulse, unlubricated titanium wheel escapement, adjusted in six positions with a free sprung balance and an overcoil hairspring made by hand. This is F.P. Jorn's most accurate mechanical watch. And note the solid gold bridges and plates. This watch, gold of case, gold of movement, is bold in any instance, and when you throw it on the wrist, you could see that this 2012 model year rollout wears quite well on my wrist. This is my favorite Jorn watch, period. Let's continue our independence theme and talk about Roger Dubuis of Geneva. This is easily the most unusual watch on the table. The Golden Square, 28 pieces in white gold, part of a line launched in 2001 when Roger Dubuis opened its manufacture. It uses the RD03 60-hour manual wind power reserve 
flying tourbillon caliber. So RD-03, you could see the Celtic cross, the symbol of the Roger Dubuis tourbillon series with a black polished cage featuring no upper bridge. That is a flying tourbillon. Power reserve indicator, white gold hands with a lovely pear style and broadsword. You have a dial that is mother of pearl with hand painted lacquered radially arrayed Art Nouveau style numerals. And then the case in white gold, which is 13 millimeters thick, 53 millimeters from lug to lug and 40 millimeters across. There is a pusher adjuster system for the double digit date. When you turn it all over, caliber RD-03 is immaculately finished. All of the standards of execution meeting the Poinçon de Genève specifications are included. And again, number three of 28, it's rare and a lucky number to boot. Throw it on the wrist, it's actually easy to wear because the case is cambered and you can see that to good effect. The watch is broad across the wrist, but it also curves to match the arc your wrist. So while it is large, it is by no means too large for my wrist. If you're looking for this era of Dubuis, you want something a bit boisterous, something that's raffish and brash. And this watch is that while still being exquisitely finished, detailed and lovingly crafted in the grandest tradition of Geneva watchmaking. Finally, I have a watch that, well, I have two watches that deserve your consideration. First, the Patek Philippe Aquanaut 5164R, a travel time to do battle with the likes of Alangu and Zona. The difference here is that this watch is both fully loomed and 120 meters water resistant, warmer than the 5164A. You can see it features a brown bronze sunburst dial with a gradient effect, lighter, almost bronze at the center and black at the outer edge. It's fully loomed and glorious light or night. As you can see, the lighting effects on this one are superlative. 40.8 millimeters in diameter. You can see through the case back the caliber 324 that powers it. It is a very accurate watch. Patek Philippe guaranteed to run minus three plus two seconds from the factory. Throw it on the wrist. It's easy to wear thanks to a brown Patek Philippe composite strap, which lovingly echoes the tones of the case as well as the dial. If you're going to buy an Aquanaut Travel Time, you may as well go a bit more bold and go gold, as this is a warmer, more handsome, more charming, and more emotionally appealing version than the standard steel watch. And this is the Aquanaut to own. Everyone says if you're going to own just one Aquanaut, get the travel time. Practical with a date, a second time zone, and a wonderful geographic feature that allows you to even cover up the reference time if you don't want it. Note how you can easily cover up that reference time simply by superimposing the hour hand over the reference hand. There, now it's a single time zone watch. A lovely piece from Patek and one of the company's best. We need to talk a little bit about Officine Panerai because I've got two on the table, one of which is an alarm and one of which is a regatta timer. We have in my left hand the 2006 200 piece limited edition Panerai Rajumir GMT alarm, 42 millimeters in rose gold. It has a GMT, it has an alarm, it even has a lovely dial of depth. As you can see, this sausage style dial with printed features has incredible depth to it. It has a GMT indicator in 24 hour format. It has a date. It has an alarm fully loomed and all of this water resistant down to 100 meters. It is a very versatile and elegant Panerai watch for those who perhaps have had their fill of the conventional Rodumir and Luminor lines. It uses a vintage Adolf Schild 5008 movement from the 70s to achieve all of these functions. Now throwing out a watch that is brand new for this model year. This is the Panerai PAM 954. 47 millimeters in grade 5 titanium. It uses a fun programmable regatta system. Now as you can see it's a flyback chronograph that you can restart and reset using a single trigger. It has radial minutes like an old Le Mania 1340 caliber. But what really sets it apart, and we're going to reset it and we're going to stop everything and watch the regatta feature. As I can step a regatta timer back in individual one minute increments down to five minutes. I can custom tailor a countdown between one minute and five by first stepping the regatta feature before I start the watch. Now setting it apart from previous efforts such as the 726 and the 526, you can see there is a matte blue sandwich style dial, an array of dark blue, light blue, and orange. This is the, this is for a transatlantic Panerai sponsored race called the Transat Classique that is raced from the Canary Islands to Bermuda and you can see the route of the race across the case back 150 pieces for the 2019 model year and as you can see totally aquatic with a 100 meter depth throw it on the wrist it is huge 57 millimeters lug to lug it's not for a small wrist but because it is titanium I could pull it off it's comfortable if a bit ungainly but you get a good sense of this watch's character and the immense complication thanks to the automatic winding flyback chronograph three-day power reserve caliber 9001 that is inside 
I don't really know where to end things, so I'm going to end with a piece that is a showstopper by any... Well, you know what? Let's go long today. Let's go a little bit crazy and add a few more to the party. Let's talk about some elemental base metal watches in titanium and stainless steel. Let's talk about Tag Heuer and Seiko. Let's talk about first the Seiko Marine Master SBDB-013. Now, this is a timepiece that came out in 2015, and if you were to measure it from side to side, it is 49.5 millimeters from side to side. If you were to measure it from lug to lug, it has no lugs. It's only slightly oblong at 50.5 millimeters, and the only thing that sets this apart from the conventional variant that I believe goes by SBDB009 is that this is part of the Prospects collection and you can see the signature X on the crown. That's all that sets it apart. You'll also appreciate the fact that this watch, which is an extraordinary 600 meters water resistant, is so hermetically sealed that it boasts on the case back in plain print that helium gas cannot intrude, therefore it needs no helium escape valve. It's a boast that Seiko upholds. Now the watch is also a spring drive, which means it has a quartz accurate but mechanical cool spring drive system driven by a spring. No motors, no batteries, no capacitors, three day power reserve accuracy of plus or minus 15 seconds per month, and a bezel that is simply sex. Listen to how smooth this is against the mic. I love the feel of that bezel. It's Rolex luxurious. Now on the wrist you can see, yes, it's big, and yes, it's almost 17 millimeters thick, but it fits easily and it's wonderfully comfortable thanks to a silicone strap in a bellows fashion. A lovely watch and a pure tool diver. You can dive with confidence in this one. It's built for this. It's basically built for the fight. Whether that be with the waves, the riptide, or sharks, or simply the daily grind is your decision. Now, jumping back real quick to a timepiece that represents the current iteration of the Monaco. This model was cataloged from 2013 to 2015. 39 millimeters with a sapphire crystal. This is often known as the Monaco Caliber 12 Black, and you can see why. A combination of signal red, silver, and black on its dial side with applique indices. This was the 39, not the prior 38 millimeter case, and through the case pack, an ETA 2894 automatic with a 42 hour power reserve in a watch that is 100 meters water resistant. Throw it on the wrist. You can see that it's a handsome watch, true to the Monaco design, but a bit larger than the previous examples, some of which featured plexiglass. You can see how it sits on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist with a handsome array of angular facets, polish, and satin. It's a sensational watch at an attractive price and a signature of Tag Heuer. If you want a Heuer watch with a Tag logo and you want the history of the original company and not necessarily the baggage of the new one, this is a perfect middle ground. Okay, I thought about where to finish things today and I wasn't quite sure, but it's gotta be this Moser. The Moser Endeavor Perpetual, blackened in titanium, rose gold indices and hands. This one is 40.8 millimeters. You can see it features caliber 341 with twin mainspring barrel and a seven day rated power reserve, though in truth, the watch will run for nine. You could see the double crested Cote de Genève across the movement, which has also been blackened. You have the twin mainspring barrel pivots set in jewel fixed chiton, or excuse me, screw fixed chiton with the jewels at center and black polished screws. Also note that the leap year phase indicator is hidden on the case back. There is a full balance bridge and you can just barely see it, but it's free sprung full balance bridge, removable as a module for rapid service servicing in Schaffhausen, the escapement itself is made of solid 14 karat gold for minimal parasitic losses. It beats away at 18,000. It has a huge overcoil hairspring made by hand exquisitely. The case back, including the sapphire, is curved to trace the arc of your wrist, and you could see the form of the Endeavor case and bezel. It's almost as though liquid metal were drawn out while molten and then flash frozen. Now turn it over to the dial side, and you can see it is a very clever mechanism, as we have a perpetual calendar that is by Bidirectional. That's right, a bidirectional perpetual calendar. You thought the Omega was cool. This is even better. This is the Andreas Streller designed Endeavor perpetual calendar system, whereby the arrow at center points to the hours. So I'm going to jump now from June to July and back to June. Bidirectional, I cannot damage it by doing this with a power reserve indicator on the dial, which is a lovely matte black. And as you could see, hack 
were stop seconds to set this watch precisely. Clean off some of the fingerprints, give you a quick wrist model. This is a watch that exhausts superlatives, as it's true high horology independent watchmaking designed by Andreas Streller, built like, built like a Moser by Moser in Schaffhausen. It's effectively the German-Swiss equivalent of FP Journe, as they make between 1,000 and 1,500 pieces a year. And if you want their signature watch, you want an Endeavor Perpetual. And if you want the most unusual Endeavor Perpetual, you want the blackened titanium in 40.8 millimeters. One last look at that case back. Exquisite. I apologize for the wrist oils, but hey, you would too. Check it out, make it yours, and live the dream on the watch box. Guys, my mouth run it over, and so doth my time. Thank you for everyone who joined. I have one last parting shot because I promised it, and here it comes. From Atelier Wen, the product of two Frenchmen out in Hong Kong, who are good friends of mine, I want to focus on a watch that features a porcelain dial. Now, this is the Howe model, with a sector-style dial reminiscent of 1940s and 50s French watches, but you'll also note exquisitely reminiscent of older Patek Philippe Calatrava 565 and 570 models. You can even see, if you look, a shade of the Acrivia Chronomet Contemporain. 39 millimeters in black polished steel. It's a handsome watch that's actually proudly Chinese made, and I like the fact that they're not pretending to be over 200 years old, Blancpain. It's a handsome watch with true fire blued hands, and you can see because the bluing is a little bit uneven, the sign of true fire annealing. The porcelain dial is a cooked ceramic that's hand painted. That's actually made in Shenzhen for them. And it features a little bit of a DZ motif with, I, I believe, Yu and Mao, the symbols symbolizing the tree or the leaves of time. And then you can see outboard the contrast between the blue of the dial and the white. I want to throw in that they have another model called the G. This, this is actually the Hao model. The G is a bit more me with polished cabochon and blue ceramic, that is blue porcelain dial. Inside, underneath the case back featuring a kunpeng, which is a sort of mythical shape-shifting Chinese bird. It's, if you will, the Chinese Bigfoot. But underneath that case back, there is a Dandong Peacock 3006, which is a small second iteration of a Swiss ETA 2824. The watch is 720 bucks, and you're not gonna find this much handmade content from the Swiss for that kind of money. I think this is fun, I think this is cool. They throw in a hell of a leather traveling case that is nicely made and suede, a little book that gives you all of their, well, their story about who they are and how the watch is made, and of course you get a lovely little package that is emblematic of traditional Chinese craft arts. If all of this sounds a little bit weird for the show, well, you know what? I have total editorial privilege and I can do whatever I want, so there. I gave you the high horology, I gave you the big finish, and now I give you a watch that I think is just damn cool, because I can see myself doing something like that down the line. Maybe not in coastal China, but all the same. Those are guys with the dream who started out like you and me. Thanks for signing on. Time out, Tim out. Thanks for logging.